Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. PYA is pleased to offer this alternative way to access our thought leadership. This is a recording of a previously delivered webinar. The information is accurate as of the date of the original event. The video recording, slides, and associated material for this and all PYA webinars are available on our website at pyapc.com. This podcast is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to be used as legal advice or an official opinion. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to PYA's Summer CPE Symposium for Hot Topics in Healthcare, Day (laughs) 1. PYA is pleased to welcome you to our third annual Summer CPE Symposium. Our second presentation of the day is Insights from the DOJ, Management Accountability for Effective Compliance Program. It will be presented by Tynan Kugler and Karen Anderson, both principals at PYA. And with that, I will hand it over to our presenters. Thank you so much, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. We are grateful to be here and glad you're spending an an hour of your time talking about all things OIG and compliance. As Karen said before we got on, we're going to talk about um, all of the, some of the nuts and bolts and and hopefully share some stories along the way too. I am a principal in, in our compensation valuation planning and design program and work primarily in fair market value compensation, compensation valuation for all kinds of different transactions and also uh, do some things in our compliance practice as well. So Karen, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay, thanks Tynan. Um, It's a pleasure to be here with everybody and with you today, Tynan. Um, I am in the uh, healthcare consultant at PYA as well and um, work a lot in regulatory compliance, privacy, and really enjoy working with clients to sort of help strengthen compliance programs and all aspects of that. And um, today we are talking about, let me get us to the first slide. So these are sort of our objectives today, what we are trying uh, to cover. And basically, I think the two messages today really are, um, the government has a set of criteria in which they judge us when they are looking into um, the practices of a healthcare company. Um, And one of the key ingredients is the company's compliance program. So since there's some new compliance program guidance out, we want to share that with you today. Also sort of share it from the government's perspective. Um, We want to talk a little bit about how specifically prosecutors or the government is going to evaluate the effectiveness of the compliance program. And in turn, what they do then is if you are under an audit or an investigation or a matter that they are looking into, that translates directly to the severity of really the the penalty, the final settlement um, between the government and the company. And so it could not be more important to really bolster your compliance program. And then because we've had the opportunity for years to sort of work in um, this arena, this compliance arena, we wanted to share best practices a lot that we have learned from you along the way. Um, and so, um, so we're just glad to be here with you today. A little bit about my background is I was a nurse turned um, healthcare lawyer, practiced for an awful long time, and my area really has long time been government investigations. So I have had the opportunity to learn also from a lot of U.S. attorneys, which is the Department of Justice, and they, in defending health healthcare providers or practices or company companies, they have shared their views with a lot along the way. And so we've got a a good bit of insight publicly and then some privately that they've shared about (laughs) what they'd like us to do. Let's see here next. Um, Go back. Okay, so we want to talk about like there's a lot of sort of serious laws. Tyner is really going to tackle today like one of the most serious laws um, and the guidance that we have on that. But I I always think the backdrop of this is most of you work at a healthcare company or practice, small or large, and what you're doing every day is delivering healthcare or some aspect of that if you're at a health insurance company or whatever, but you are very focused on healthcare activities, humans taking care of humans. And at the end of the day, there's some common business activities that you do in the midst of all of this healthcare service. Um, And I just listed some here because these are some of the common ones that that turn into violations of rather serious laws. And they can be sort of easy things that happen, right? 
Tine and Caesars all the time. Medical director agreement. That's something you've got a special service line that you're starting a cardiology practice. You need a medical director for that. You're going to get an agreement to compensate them for their time. One of the common violations of that is paying them too much per hour or per, you know, per whatever, but it takes it above fair market value. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about some of these laws, but um, so that can that can be a stark violation. It also can be an anti-kickback violation. Um, a lease that we see this a lot, a lease for a hospital owns a lot of land. You own the campus, right? And then a hospital would lease to physician practices for their private practice that they're starting there. And let's you have to charge fair market value. That translates to charging a certain amount per square foot. You missed a closet. That square footage that was not in the lease, that's a Stark violation. So you didn't charge enough rent because you didn't consider that. Perhaps it's a Stark violation, let me say that. Um, the hospital recruited a physician to the community. You're trying to bring specialists into your community. You do a recruiting agreement with that physician. Um, they're arriving the next day. They didn't think about having furniture in the waiting room. The hospital happens to have a bunch of furniture they're not using. They're just going to throw that in there. So that's outside the contract. It might be valuable enough that that, again, takes that to sort of too much value has been given in the recruiting agreement. It might be an any kickback problem, and it might also be a stark problem. So, and then day after day, we would deliver healthcare services and claims for medical services. We are billing and coding all day long. And so it's sometimes it is difficult to get the correct code for the services or have the documentation to support it. So a common violation would be the hospital submitted an incorrect code and received higher reimbursement. And that would be a false claims act. We'll talk today a lot about, this will make sense as we go along, I promise. We'll talk a lot about false claims act um, today and those violations. And that's because um, all these arrangements, if you violate the Stark law or violate the anti-kickback law, they'll say that the contract itself, let's take that medical director contract, is bad. And so all of the claims, let's say it was a three-year contract, all of those claims are considered false claims now, if that arrangement did not meet the requirements of the law. And so when we say there's a Stark violation or an anti-kickback violation, that means there will also be a false claim that case. And so, again, this will make sense in a minute. And I know you probably know that already, but um, we just want to make that clear. So, Karen, every, uh, to, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, one of the things about that list is, you know, none of these are really new. These are these are arrangements that hospitals, health systems, practices, um, you know, hospitals have with other providers of services. These are arrangements that, that have been ongoing for years. And so it's so interesting that we still keep seeing some of these as sort of low hanging fruit from the government's perspective, which gets back to, you know, the strength of your program, the strength of your policies and procedures, and, you know, sort of always making sure you've got your house in good order. So it's just, there, there are some new things that the government's given us guidance on, but it's, a lot of the same things we keep seeing over and over and over um, that are that are coming still coming to the attention of, of the government. So that, I think that is a great that is a great point. This is just continues to be a challenge. Yep. And then this is just OK, so lawyer, uh, I'm a lawyer by trade, so we don't do math. So I, <laughs> I don't want anyone to sort of pit, start picking apart the calculation. But um, I just brought this is an older U.S. Supreme Court case. And this is uh, the one time I saw the judge being very sympathetic towards the provider. So I wanted to share this, plus it talked about the penalties. So we talked about any of those everyday situations could be a false claim. So this is a US Supreme Court case from 1997. And the case was one that we have probably seen before. This was a rural community. A psychiatrist had worked there long-term. Um, he was, I think, one of the only mental health professionals in a large area. It was an elderly and poor population that he treated, meaning most of them have a government health insurance program. Um, so he's submitting claims um, to Medicare and Medicare. He provided therapy sessions, usually 45 to 55 minutes, he said is what he booked. That's code A, claim code A that he's submitting. 
um, <clears throat> at whatever point he be, gets investigated and they look back seven years, as they do, they can look back a long time period. And they said his documentation and his medical records did not support code A and he should have billed for code B. So for instance, he didn't have very clearly start time and end time. And again, one of the judges said, you know, this is a small town practitioner just trying to help people. They're not, not so worried about sort of those kinds of things in his documentation, more about the diagnosis and the therapy and treatment and that kind of thing. So that's the scene. So basically it was a difference of like $20 in the code. But during this seven year period, there were 8,000 claims, 8,002. That ended up being about 245,000. So the difference that he got, and that's not what matters to the government, but he was overpaid 245,000 over seven years. But this is the government's claim based on that situation is, okay, in the False Claims Act, there are three financial penalties. One is you don't get to pay back the difference, you pay back all the money. So for 8,002 claims, every penny you got, that goes back. So that's step one, that always happens. And all of you that handle overpayments, I know we have a lot of compliance professionals and officers on the line, um, right? We know, we know that process of overpayment and paying back. The second part is, and it depends on the, we're gonna talk about the company's conduct today, but it depends on the conduct of the company. How strong was the compliance program? They will take that same amount of money and then multiply it times three. So up to travel damages. And when you're defending those claims, you know, you might argue, okay, this is more like a 1.5, you know, that multiplier that we should add on that, that kind of thing. So anywhere, one, one time to three times can be that. So that's the category. Another category is they can add a civil monetary penalty per claim. So again, we have 8,000 claims. At that time, that was $10,000 was the monetary penalty. And today we are more in the 14,000 to 28,000 range. So when you add up at that time, what the government went, this was actually tried in court and they appealed it and it went all the way to the US Supreme Court was, the government was saying he owes us $80 million. And this is, and sitting on the other side in the courtroom, if we've all watched our court shows on TV, right? Is the, the little old psychiatrist, you know, who's worked, works long hours and long time and is like, I mean, that is, you know, just funny money at that point. So, um, so anyway, I wanted to give you that, that that's sort of the structure. So we have every kind of everyday things that we do all the time and they can turn into these incredibly, serious laws with incredibly serious penalties. Um, and so that's just something, you know, I know, again, a lot of you know that, but it's interesting when you put it in a case and then you see how it actually works out. I taught law school for a little while and I'm all the law students would just like pass out when they saw this. So um, it's, and, and so do people when they're involved in these claims, right? So it's very concerning. So, okay, we won't stay on all the bad stuff, but, um, for the government, so they have a lot of these cases, right? That's one case. So they have a whole lot of these cases. They keep statistics on this. So at the very end here, right, is 2023. Um, and they regulate healthcare through criminal laws, right? Civil laws with these civil pen financial penalty penalties. The other stick that they have is exclusion. So if they think the conduct of the healthcare company is, is significant enough and it meets what is a law, there's exclusion criteria, then you, you as a company or individuals can be excluded from um, healthcare programs, meaning they, they cannot work somewhere that submits claims to the government. So that's another sort of, you know, that would take you out of working in healthcare, right? If that's been your experience all your life and then suddenly you can't do that. Um, interesting in 2023, that you know this is tracking all false claims act recoveries is 80 percent of those are from healthcare, and we've seen that over time sort of more and more of these cases are from healthcare, and then 87 percent of those cases are from whistleblowers so whistleblowers remember often come from your employees or your vendors um, people that know something about your business and are concerned about something and tell tell the government and actually file a lawsuit um, to say, we think that that company has violated the law. So that's just a, a little bit of an overview.
And then just to drill down a little bit on 2023 is, <clears throat> so those cases that we saw in the last graph, the government recovered $2.68 billion from those False Claims Act settlements. And that's $2.68 billion. And then that money goes back into the Medicare program. And then we talked about whistleblowers. They can get from 15 to 30 percent ish. Um, so, you know, that's a money maker, right? You report this to the government, you follow that lawsuit through till it's settled, and then they get a portion of that. So, if you were a whistleblower, um, the total paid to whistleblowers last year was $267 million. And the government tells us, like, the False Claims Act is one of our most important tools for rooting out fraud and for ensuring that public funds are spent properly and safeguarding our programs. And what they mean is definitely is they do take this money and they put it back in the Medicare fund. And we see at the bottom, you know, I looked at the Medicare expenditure expenditures in 2023 exceeded 1 trillion. So they are always trying to sort of replenish if they feel like, you know, that providers were overpaid, you know, they benefit from having these large penalties on these settlements and they just put that back in the Medicare fund. So that is how that is how the world works. Yeah, and I think the other thing we've heard, you know, in the relative sort of recent, Karen, is that, um, you know, just like everybody else, the government's understaffed. And so a lot of times they will rely, you know, the fact that you can be a relator or a whistleblower is a, is a, way for them to have eyes and ears that they don't have the staff necessarily to do. Um, and I, I think the ones that we look at and see are, are cases too from a whistleblower standpoint where people really have tried to go through the process of raising the issue internally and for whatever reason have not felt that they've been effective at raising the issue internally. And then, you know, I mean, always they're going to sort of be the bad actors, but I think the ones that you see come to fruition is you do see patterns of people trying to do the right thing and organizations or individuals not not adhering to the things that they've put in place. And then that's ultimately what then people say it's the last straw and they call the government. Um, so it, it's as much about the process and what you do every day which Karen will get into, um, but but they are effectively people out there that are eyes and ears for the government and have the, the pathway to do it. And this is, false claims goes back to what, 1860s? I mean, this goes mm -hmm. back, This and it's not specific to healthcare. It's just, a, it's a fascinating history, but it's a it's eyes and ears. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's a great point, Tynan, because so many times you you, that's part of the compliance program, right? Is having an effective way for people to report their concerns and then making sure those concerns get investigated. And then you come back to that. And one thing yesterday, I was on a, a, a meeting with a lot of international compliance officers, um, which is kind of fascinating, but um, with, they have sort of global concerns that, you know, luckily we don't have to think about those things. But um, one thing that they said, one of the speakers said 70% of they had tracked of their compliance concerns that were raised were misunderstandings. So someone genuinely heard something in a meeting or saw just the way someone talked about it and was genuinely concerned that perhaps we were doing something wrong. The compliance, they had a very good process for investigations and getting back to that person and sort of showing them like, hey, here's the part you didn't know or let us show you these documents, how we do this. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, we just have been able to sort of, you know, successfully put people's mind to rest. And then of course the other 30%, you know, Maybe those are our actual problems that they need to address. But I thought that was interesting to say, gosh, that really is the majority of our work, hearing the concern, investigating the concern, getting back to the person. So you, you can't sort of underscore how important that is as a part of your program, I think. Sorry, I could go on for hours. We won't, we promise, it's an hour. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so the other piece of this we wanted to say is, okay, so the we talked about the government having a playbook. Right. And so in the U.S. Justice Manual, they um, they and I put that there so you can see that, you know, they give prosecutors um, exactly <laughs> procedurally, you know, what they should look at, what they consider should consider as they are going through the process. So the first thing they do is investigate. Right. They might ask you for documents. They might ask to interview some of your employees once they feel like they have all the facts. They've reviewed your medical records. 
they have to make some decisions. And so in the course of working with, if you've ever been in that situation as a healthcare company or a practice and you've worked with the Department of Justice who's asked, or the OIG, um, who's asked you for some documentation, um, you know, one thing is you know the documents in your company and just be sure to raise your hand if you're like, hey, I think this might be helpful for them to see or know about internally. And of course, do all this through the guidance of legal counsel. But prosecutors are going to look once they've investigated and say, should charges be brought? And then they're going to decide, should those just be civil charges, meaning the penalty will be money? Or should there also be criminal charges? Um, and, sh and, you know, and they look at individuals as well, just so you know. I'm talking generally about the company's conduct, but they do look at that as well, an individual liability. And then they're going to look at, okay, so should a settlement be offered? And as I said, most of these do result in settlement. But when they're looking at the settlement, you know, they've got a range to consider, OK, I've learned about this company. I've learned about what they do or what they have in place. And so how much should the financial penalties be? Like how much should that multiplier be? Two times, three times that amount of money? It adds up. The other thing is, does the conduct warrant, you know, monitoring or reporting going forward? So maybe they say, you know, they really need to be under a corporate integrity agreement, which is this other agreement that you would have with the Office of Inspector General. And just so you know who I'm talking about, sorry, I'll stop a second. The Department of Justice is the lawyer and the OIG, I view, is the police for Health and Human Services. So the police, they can be detectives, they investigate. You know, they can be agents, they can come to your house and interview witnesses, but basically that's the police for health and human services, for Medicare and Medicaid. They make sure there's no fraud and then they, you know, provide that information or work with the Department of Justice. So anyway, sometimes you hear from both, which is very alarming. So, but the OIG says, um, hey, I think going forward, I think they maybe they have such an immature compliance program. It's in its infancy and we think we've got to monitor that they're strengthening that and that they're auditing themselves and they're working on things. So, so that's when you'll see a corporate integrity agreement that really says they're going to have to continue to report for us for the next three years or five years. And then they decide, um, should the, should the company just be excluded, right? Should individuals be excluded and not be allowed to participate in the program that the, the conduct is so egregious that we think certain people shouldn't be allowed to submit claims anymore. So, so that's sort of what the prosecutor's doing in their head as they're evaluating you and the information that they're giving to you. And again, I'm simplifying this down. Now this, we can all draw on because this is also what they're looking at and just pick your favorite crime show because this is right. We know this is what they do. They look at the conduct. I mean, how pervasive was it? Um, did it go on for 10 years? Has it only been going on for six months? Um, how serious was it? Was it just one physician contract or was it all 200 in the company, right? So they're looking at the conduct. They're also looking at the response to the conduct. When you found out, what did you do? You know, did you immediately start to fix things or whatever? Or did you just kind of let this go for 12 months and then finally decide what to do? Then you came to the government. Um, Confession, right? We know that's important. So did you immediately confess? Did you go through the, you know, oh, the self-disclosure programs that are available? Um, they look at priors, you know, they look, have you been before us before? Have you had a prior, you know, settlement agreement with us on this very same conduct? Um, they look at your degree of cooperation. They look, you know, again, you should cooperate under the guidance of legal counsel. Um, but they look to see. You know, if you're trying to sort of dive in and work with them, um, a lot of times, for instance, we if you've worked with the government a lot, you'll say, look, will you let us do the investigation ourselves and we'll give you the results. We promise to be transparent and sometimes they'll let you do that. So that's an aside. Good faith. They're looking for is your compliance program effective? So those of you that are compliance um, professionals, you might be like, no, look, I've got my plan and my work plan and my audit plan and I'm doing all these things. So they're looking at that. And then they're looking at what corrective action, again, what did you jump in and do? Did you start, every healthcare provider I know, when something goes wrong, they start fixing stuff in their head. We should have done this, we should have done this. It's just very natural. So I think you'll usually have a lot to show there about, look, we got right on it. We got legal counsel. We started doing this to prevent 
you know, prevent whatever was going on. So, so you know what they're looking for because we've watched a little TV and we know. <laughs> so, and then U.S. Sentencing Guidelines, just so you know, this is again something they look at. And this is one of the key things that they say they're looking for, an effective compliance and ethics program. And they say an organization shall exercise due diligence to prevent and detect criminal conduct. So that's what they expect your compliance program does, is that it prevents it and it detects it. And so that all those laws have criminal elements that we talked about. And so they're expecting you to prevent violation of those laws. And then they also want you to promote a culture that encourages ethical conduct, right? And a commitment to complying with the law. So that's allowing people to report, looking into things, um, what Tyron was talking about earlier. Um, and, and generally you wanna be able to show that it is an effective program. We'll talk about that in a minute too. So, um, so when you're looking, they're looking at these things, but I know you all look at this yourself, particularly compliance professionals or senior leadership is, do we have a compliance program, you know, that fully covers all the things we're supposed to cover? Is it effective? Does it seem to be working? Um, or do we have one of the things that I, sometimes when we work with clients is they expect you to have those laws, the requirements of those laws defined in written policies? Because if your employees don't know that that's a requirement, I mean, how would they follow it? And so you that the policies and procedures are really I think when they start to talk to you about it, they want to see what's in place and they want to see that there's training, right? Tying into you, I see you nodding your head. Yeah. 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 Cause it's, you know, it's one of those things you say, okay, well, we have a policy. Well, where's the policy? I mean, I remember with some things, you know, the first question asked of, you know, the government will be if somebody they're interviewing is, well, do you have a policy? The answer better be, yes, we have a policy. And then where is your policy? And then the answer should be, well, here's where I know where to go find the policy. And so the answers to some of those, what presumably innocuous questions at the beginning can, can really tell a lot about what you just shared, Karen, is the organizational culture, the commitment, the training. And so it's, it's this is a living and breathing something every single day. And it's, it's hard, admittedly, as Karen said, humans, you know, treating humans, if this is not, we live in this day to day, this is what we do for our careers. If you don't live in it day to day, and we know a lot of you that are um, listening on the symposium are, are not folks that necessarily are in compliance every single day. And it's, if nothing else, the goal is just to, to raise the awareness and to help facilitate so that it's a, it can be a collective effort within an organization. And we'll kind of touch on that as we go along too. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think a couple of things that we want to stress today, because I know some of you are in compliance and some of you are leadership. And so, um, you know, it might be financial leadership, executive, senior leadership, or board members. And one of the things that they really talk about is oversight of the compliance program is are those senior leaders really engaged in not just receiving the reports from the compliance officer let's, every quarter, um, but really um, asking questions, you know, being knowledgeable about the law, knowledgeable enough to sort of know some of the trends to, um, to ask questions. Um, are you asking, do they have the resources that they need? You know, they might have a big fancy plan and then one person to do it. And so they need to check, do you have the systems you need, those kinds of things, and just being really engaged. I mean, that is, that is definitely what they're looking for. Oh, polling question number one. Thanks, you guys. Um, well, the company, the first question up today is the company's liability for violation of a health care law may be reduced if board members actively oversee the compliance program, repeated violations of this law in the past, no company compliance training in the past two years, the compliance work plan is outdated and not audited or insufficient compliance staffing to complete work plan. And remember, you must fill out the polling questions to receive CPE credit. Thank you for participating in our poll. I'll hand it back to our presenters. Sharp group here, Karen. Oh, yeah, they are. <laughs> 
boards members actively overseeing the compliance program or senior leadership, I would say too, will reduce the liability for the company for sure. Let's see, oh, sorry. Okay, here we go. So next we're really gonna talk about, so we, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, what the government expects of us and how they evaluate compliance programs and what they have done for us finally is they have given us last year at the end of the year, some general compliance program guidance to apply to all of us that are healthcare providers or operate healthcare companies. Um, this is from the Office of Inspector General. And what it is, is there is this really, really good website that they have. And it has just kind of everything that you need on it. It's got links to other documents. So basically used to be, we had to shop for all this stuff. We kept all this all over our computer from regulations to different manuals they'd given us. And this is all combined in one. So um, for those of you that haven't gone here, I. I'd, I'd take a look even while we're talking. Um, it's sort of one-stop shopping to give you the guidance that you need for a compliance program and then even for certain activities. We wanna tell you some of the new things. Today won't be a com comprehensive overview of every single thing in that guidance, but one thing we wanna emphasize if you haven't already added it to your work plan this year is that patient safety and patient quality is now part of the compliance program and they expect to see that as part of your work plan and things that you're auditing on. So if you haven't done that yet, we'd recommend that to you. And this compliance guidance, they will tell you is voluntary. But again, what we just talked about is this is what they look at. This brings down your risk as a company. And so it's really important. It's a big financial risk. So this is a place to spend time in your company. And so anyway, this is a little bit about what that website is and we just, we recommend it to you for sure. We'll talk a little bit today about all that general guidance, but one thing that they did tell us is in 2024, they are gonna begin giving industry specific guidance. So that's general guidance and this will be specific. So look for this year, four, they say they're gonna issue four for hospitals, and that will be helpful to have specific guidance for hospitals. Clinical laboratories is a good example. I can imagine if some of you are trying to look at compliance from a lab perspective, that might not be an area you're super knowledgeable about. And so they're gonna give specific information on that. Also nursing facilities and Medicare Advantage, as we all know, is a big area. That's all, all the claims are getting submitted. So they're gonna give specific guidance on that. So this is just a watch out for it. it that is coming and should be helpful information. This is nothing new to all of you, um, but what we wanted to say in the compliance guidance is these are still, still, they're using the same framework, just the seven elements of a successful compliance program. We already talked about policies. We're gonna emphasize throughout today, leadership and oversight, training and education, having open lines of communication within with the compliance officer, um, that's from an employee all the way to the board, right? Making sure there's a flow of communication about it. Enforcing standards. We're gonna have a little conversation. They've, they've really talked about adding incentives um, to people that are bringing things forward, but also having consequences if somebody violates a rule over and over, right? Making sure there's a consequence. Risk assessment, audited and monitoring. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. And then again, as we said, when you detect something, how do you respond to it? having corrective action initiatives. So the same framework that we all know is still, still in place. Um, general themes that we saw in the new compliance program guidance is um, operational effectiveness. So, and I, they say not the structure, but again, whatever you have in place, however small or ever, however big you are, and they give some leniency for being a smaller practice. We didn't put this information in here but it's on the in the guidance. Um, it tells you if you're a smaller place or practice, here are some things that they understand, you know, that might work for you. So look, be sure to look at that. But anyway, don't just have a plan on paper, make sure it works. That's something they're looking for. Also make sure that when you're doing the risk assessment that note that it should change every year, right? It should be fluid. Like, you have new risks, you're gonna evaluate those. So they're looking for that you are actively updating 
your risk assessment, for instance. The compliance committee will talk about their roles um, today, but they're really looking at, you know, the compliance officer cannot do this by themselves. And they've recognized that. And they expect the compliance committee to be formed and to be active. And that should be members of, of several different departments in the organization. And they shouldn't just be another board that just listens to the compliance officer. They should be helping. They're, they have actual roles that they should be doing. So it's something they've seen before that it's been ineffective and they want the compliance committee to be active. And again, you see the same thing. There's a focus on high level accountability from committee boards and owners. One of the things they've called out is private equity owners. And the criticism was that they said, okay, this is private equity owners and they've been in other industries and now they've let's perhaps purchased several healthcare companies and what they found in some of the investigations is that private equity owners were not knowledgeable about healthcare. They bought into an industry and didn't know much about it. And so there wasn't an effective compliance. They weren't putting resources into it. And this is absolutely not all private equity, but this is, I'm just telling you, this is the government is focusing on it because of some past experiences. And I'm, I would simply tell you that that's going to translate into always looking at owners, the owners, the board, the senior leadership across the board, whether it's private equity involved or not. So mm -hmm. anything, time you want to add on that? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So now enough of me. Turn it over Tyne and who's going to do the complicated stuff. <laughs> no, just, just a couple of things. I mean, I, I can't um, I can't stress enough what Karen said about the, the website and access to it and even the PDF. The what, what she she didn't say is it's a 91 page document. So, you know, it can be a little daunting, but it, it is very, very well organized. And, you know, you can click around and find different things. And of course, one of the things that, that I did was go in and look and see, OK, what are the things in here that could potentially affect the work that, you know, that we do on a day in and day out basis? And one of the things they've also done is they've sort of put some tidbits along the way of, OK, well, here's why we're asking you to do this. And there's one specific section in the regulatory piece. And I will tell you, this is page 12 of the 91. Um, <laughs> but they, they basically say that, you know, organizations, individuals and entities have to evaluate. They should evaluate arrangements that implicate the, the anti-kickback statute and those that do not fit into a safe harbor by reviewing the totality of the facts and circumstances including the intent of the parties. So they have really specifically said, here's what we expect you to do. They don't just leave it at that, they then give you some tools. And I think one of the really effective things that they did was this particular section gives you a whole list of questions effectively to ask. And it has a, you know, it has a, um, a triangle with a, you know, like warning sign that says, you know, these are the problem, these are the things where we see the problems. And they go through and for each one of these, these topics that's listed here, they give you a question to ask yourself. And, you know, one of the things we did is we have several tools which you know, we are happy to share, but we, we often find checklists are a really great way to communicate how to assess risk. And so we've got one that's for medical director needs assessments. We've got one for commercial reasonableness. And interestingly, a lot of the things that we had in our checklist were things that were on here, which was, you know, good for us because that says to us the things that we are advising clients and are, are telling people they need to be aware of are the same things that the government has said Here's if you've got to prioritize, here's where you need to prioritize. So a couple of things just to hit on is they're really focused on the, the degree of influence and referrals. So looking at the nature of the arrangements, how were people for an arrangement selected? How did you make the decision to hire this doctor or to offer this doctor compensation or to buy this physician's practice or to enter into this management services agreement? Um, always the, the way that the, the compensation or remuneration is determined will, will get looked at. And is it consistent with fair market value? So fair market value is continues to be a big issue. And then commercial reasonableness is a big issue. Is, is it a legitimate, is there a legitimate, reasonable, documented, um, supportable story for why you entered into an arrangement. And so that gets back to sort of the what are the facts and circumstances. 
They also talk about what are the items and services that are going to be provided to make sure that you know they are in fact reasonable and aren't aren't something that's just being purchased or or procured for you know in return for those referrals. Karen, you can go to the next slide. Okay. And then a couple of other things, um, you know, they've they've thrown in some you know vernacular <laughs> sort of industry vernacular too is, you know, they they're asking you people to think through as they're focusing on these arrangements, what's the impact? What is the impact to the to the federal program, to Medicare, Medicaid gonna be? Is this gonna incent over utilization? Is it gonna, you know, raise costs? Steering, um, you know, they actually in here use the term, you know, cherry picking and lemon dropping. And so, you know, they want to make sure that um, these types of arrangements are the people that are entering into these arrangements are being good stewards of the dollars that are being spent by the government. And again, no surprise, but conflicts of interest. We we continue to see that come up. We see that um, a lot in the area of physician-owned distributorships, other mm -hmm. places, and then the manner in which the arrangement is documented. So that gets back to sort of that number one of the seven elements is, is it written, is it documented, and then is it followed? So the one other page in there, and I went from like the beginning of the document to the end of the document, Karen, to the next slide. This is page 80. Um, and this was also really interesting to us because if you, in the sort of in the fine print, if you go about halfway, maybe two thirds of the way down this, this um, paragraph, they actually say entities should consider what type of centralized arrangements tracking system to establish. So they are suggesting effectively that organizations have some kind of centralized arrangement that they're tracking. They also, you know, they don't they don't say you have to do it this way or that way. They say, you know, think about the size of your organization and what makes sense. But you do need to have some way to centralize, support the documentation, review the documentation, include supporting documentation in that centralized area, or have it be able to be found easily. And I think that's the key is you know, a little bit off track, but when we when we go and we look at some of the things that are coming out of COVID and COVID re, you know, enforcement, a lot of it is oh related God. to what? Documentation. And in the heat of the moment, people aren't documenting, people leave, people come. There's a, a question that could be a perfectly reasonable, logical, you know, inadvertent question, but there's no documentation. So it's really, really what's old is new, document, 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 keep your policy and procedures and pay attention to some of the nuanced language that they've included in here. And, and I will say, Tyne, I know you've seen this too, is just this is a practical point, is when people are transitioning either out of the company or they've gone on leave is probably the most practical advice is just to make sure you know, you've gone back and tick and tied as well as you can. Do you have all the documentation you need for that person before they leave? It's always crazy when there's transition times, but <coughs> so many times there's a historic loss of information, right? Yep. It's that and it's organizations that are more um, decentralized. So, you know, the bigger you are, the more decentralized, potentially the more decentralized. And I think that's where we found it's, again, it's human, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not intent. Oftentimes it's, what somebody I heard on a podcast recently say is sloppiness. It's just, it's inadvertent sloppiness and yeah. um, just, just not keeping up with it. So, yeah. Okay. So I think just a little bit more on the financials, we touched on this before is, you know, following the money is, 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 is always going to be key is so if you're paying somebody being able to, to follow, what are you paying them? How are you paying them? Did you pay them according to the contract? They, they hit a little bit more on private equity here as well. Um, and, you know, regular coding, uh, regular reviews of billing and coding practices that I think that's something for a while. It's not that it went away, but we didn't see as much, at least from a consulting, I'd say maybe five years ago, it was not nearly, we have not, we weren't getting nearly the requests for billing and coding audits from private practices, from hospitals and health systems. I think that there's been a big uptick in that work. And so I think that's indicative of what the government has been focused on. Mm -hmm. So I think that might bring us to our next polling question. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. The next question is, what is not included 
in the OIG's compliance program guidance. Patient safety and quality are part of compliance. Companies should evaluate physician hospital arrangements. Compliance committee must be active and engaged. Compliance officer should not report to the legal department or the hospital cafeteria menu. Thank you so much for participating in the poll and I will hand it back over to our presenters. Oh, thank you so much. Let's see here. There we go. Okay, sorry. Um, so we want to talk a little bit, just to wrap us up, sort of the best practices we said we talk about and the government's, you know, kind of tying in the government's ex expectations for an effective compliance program. So what is it, what does that look like in practice? One of the most important things that they stressed in the new compliance um, program guidance was a risk assessment. So the OIG um, does a work plan every year where they say these are the risks that we're going to sort of monitor. You want to mirror that same process um, annually. Look at what are what are our current risks that we need to work on this year. Um, they might be new risks. You might know that a new law has just come into effect. And there's that's something you need to operationalize and have policies around and training. You not you might want to remove risks. Like you don't necessarily want to keep things on there all the time, or your plan's going to be huge. Um, so you're like, oh, you know, we've we've operationalized that. We we've, we've got that. Our audits are showing good effectiveness. That one comes off. And then at the end, whatever your list is for that year, you want to you want to rank it and sort of say this is high priority and low. And I say this because this is what will happen right something will happen this year that is not on the work plan some new law will come into effect something will some audits a trend of audits come up and everyone gets sort of overwhelmed with that you're going to need to slide things in on this plan and so you need to know the ones at the bottom that maybe can get sort of moved off the priority list um, based on the adjustment so this is sort of your core annual risk assessment know your company's risks um, the compliance committee, again, I'll just say has a responsibility for that. They want to see them sort of using like if you all have done enterprise risk management, that's a framework you can use. Um, they will, um, the compliance guidance emphasizes some really core issues that they expect are common compliance risk areas. It's what we've talked about today. Billing. I will say something about sales and marketing. Whenever someone comes to try to sell you something and says, "Oh, you should use this, you know, home monitoring kit that we that we've got," um, and and use this code, bill it under this code. Do not run. Do not take that advice. This is a fraud area, and the government is very big on sort of salespeople, marketing people that are. Um, tying a device that they're selling to a code that you can bill. Um, quality of care, we talked about that, but again, these are the, sort of the things that they emphasize as common risk areas that should be at least evaluated to be part of your plan. Um, so once you've got the risk plan, you want to have a plan to mitigate that risk, and then how do we measure the results, right? How are we doing as we go? So this was just an example. Your compliance work plan is I've got the risk. Here's here are here are ways strategies that we can mitigate that risk and then tied to that strategy um and these were just examples of things that could be on your work plan but tied to that strategy will be an audit plan what how are we going to measure it and then how often will we analyze that and then you know do we need to revise our plan so this is all sort of a you know all has to work together um, the OIG toolkit on measuring compliance program effectiveness, I've got that at the bottom of the audit plan. That's a very, very helpful document to let you, um, you know, let you give you some ideas about how to measure. Because sometimes I think we have several folks in our company that are very good at auditing, monitoring. I think that's sometimes a challenging thing to think, figure out how to how to do that. Um, reporting, you know, this is uh, those of you that are in compliance a lot is they really the compliance guidance is really looking to make sure you've got an organization that reports up and down. Right. So an employee will feel comfortable addressing concerns um, and that you're reporting all the way to the board. And just there's a flow of information through through compliance. Right. Um, they also really 
emphasize compliance officer reporting to the board committee. These are the kinds of things that they would look for a compliance officer to report, issues that are trending up, maybe issues that are trending down that you've been able to mitigate, um, but things they should watch out for, new risks, um, and, you know, and then also updating the board when there is a violation of law, when something has happened. We've seen that before when somebody maybe just sort of keeps it to themselves and works it through compliance a little too long when it really needed to be reported to senior leadership and the board. So um, they want to see that. Um, there's a little bit in, in the new compliance guidance about compliance officers. And I think the main takeaway there is really to say the compliance officer should not have a role in finance, in legal, in oper the business operations, or clinical. So their role should be compliance. Um, they should also not really be doing risk manage management. Um, but their goal is to you know, operate, run the compliance program, and advise the leaders of the risks and, you know, and oversee that um, audit plan um, and just, you know, continually working the compliance plan. Also emphasize they should have the same authority as a senior leader. They, they're somebody that should report directly to the CEO and the board um, and be given sort of that authority to tell the company what's going on. On the side here is just key risks. We've talked about a lot of these already today, but um, in the compliant, compliance guidance, um, but also when we happen to be in the Healthcare Compliance Association, we were presenting, the OIG was presenting as well in April in Nashville. And so um, one of the, o, the OIG senior counsel was there and these were things she really emphasized, right? The role of the compliance officer, here's key risks they will be focusing on as the OIG. So it, it was, it mirrored the compliance guidance, but it was nice to hear from her exactly what she is looking for. There's no question that these were the things sort of in their mind. Um, some of this is repeats again, but we wanted to sort of say these are big things in the compliance guidance that we would look for. One of the things I mentioned a little bit earlier was they are looking for the compliance officer to be there, to be at the board quarterly. So, and that there should be time reserved for an executive session where the compliance officer can meet just with the board without other officers there in case you need to say the CEO is not doing a good job or that's, that's actually the culprit or whatever, but um, that you can have a private session. Um, and again, they really, really have em emphasized the compliance committee's involvement in the risk assessment process. So again, not leaving it all to the compliance officer. And then uh, I know I keep saying sort of the same things over and over, but that is this is again from the OIG. Um, these were duties that she wanted to make sure the compliance committee members knew, um, you know, that they should attend, they should actively participate, right? But interestingly, they really had a lot of conversations about what I'd call the carrot and the stick. But on the stick, they expected performance evaluations. If you're a compliance committee member in your organization, um, but performance evaluations to be impacted. If you are not doing your job and you're not sort of carrying forward the torch of the your role in the compliance committee, then you shouldn't get a bonus or it should be reduced or your raise should be reduced. They want to see that there is a consequence there. They've also added sort of this concept of incentives. If people come forward, I think I mentioned that, you know, maybe they should get compensation or maybe they should just get recognition. I'd probably go with recognition on that. That's just me. But anyway, um, board members, she also went over duty. So again, from the OIG, and this is one thing I really would recommend to everybody that's in a senior leadership position or on a board is the practical guidance for healthcare boards on compliance oversight. I think that's been around, I'm probably gonna have the wrong year, but I'm not even gonna say the year because I'm sure it's wrong. But anyway, it's been around several years. It's super helpful. Um, it tells you exactly what they expect of board members. And I would, I would recommend that to everybody. And again, the OIG said, we expect you to be knowledgeable about the laws. We expect you to make sure there are sufficient resources for compliance programs and officers to maintain the program. Um, so sort of the same thing we heard before, but um, this is what they emphasize. And the final note, I think that we really wanted to say 
is this is again, if we go back to what the prosecutors or the US attorneys are looking at, they one of the things they're looking at is minimally required is the organization's governing authority um, shall be knowledgeable about the content and operation of the compliance and ethics program and shall exercise reasonable oversight with respect to the implementation of that program. And that high level personnel, so that could be senior leaders, shall ensure that the organization has an effective compliance and ethics program as described in this guideline. And um, so again, that is, you can tell, I've hit some of the same things just over and over and over today. Um, but I think that you can tell that that's, that's how important those things are um, from the government's perspective and how they'll eval evaluate your program. And I think that puts us to polling question number three. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is, board's compliance responsibilities do not include obtaining knowledge about compliance risks and topics, reviewing compliance risk assessment reports, asking questions about how compliance operates, requesting information or training on compliance issues, and conducting compliance audits personally. Remember, remember you must fill out the polling questions to receive CPE credit Thank you for participating in our poll. Now I will hand it back over to Karen and Tynan. Oh, I think Tynan, last notes? No, I think this is just um, good good tips, good information, and your your bedtime reading, beach reading is uh, the the general compliance program guidance. But you can select the areas you want to you want to tackle first. So, but we really appreciate your attendance and um, taking the time out of your busy schedules and days to 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 join us and to participate in our our summer symposium. I think that's all we have. Well, thank you so much to our presenters. Now I'll hand it back over to Catherine to close us out. Thanks, Caitlin. On behalf of PYA, thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you tomorrow for day two of the Summer CPE Symposium, where our presenters will share with us an annual accounting and auditing update and share some information about critical pathway information technology and how to prepare for a cyber disaster. We hope you'll join us and we hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. The video recording, slides, and associated material for this and all PYA webinars are available on our website. If you have any questions or if we can help, please contact us at pyapc.com. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Hey!